Even after all these years, I never want to take for granted what a privilege that it is to preach God's Word. You know, anytime someone shows up to hear God's Word and the ability for you to share it, man, so valuable. God could count that as an honor to be in a position to speak into a generation who needs him so much. It is such an incredible responsibility as well. I want, I want to talk to you tonight, or this morning, I guess I should say, I want to talk to you on a message title and a message thought that, man, it's just really got a hold of me. I guess the best way to put it, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't come here to play church this morning. I have a mission God's put something in my heart, and I believe it's high time for the church to become militant in one regard and be active. Anybody familiar with reserves in the military? You know what being in reserves means versus being active duty? And uh, I don't take away from the great men and women who have served as reserves, but how many of you know the greatest military is an active military, not just people that are in reserves, but a working military, and that's what we need to be. And as a Christian community, I think that we need to gather ourselves together and experience personal revival. Those of you that are not here, you may be watching online, you missed a great deal of advice at the beginning of the service before we went live, And um, but for those of you that are here, hopefully you'll take it to heart. I'm going to be preaching out of the book of Acts this morning, chapter number 28, if you want to go ahead and get your Bible. I have never preached this before. This will be brand new. Um, Never seen this, never thought about this. Something God brought to my heart, Acts chapter 28. I've preached from this story multiple times throughout my ministry. Thankful for the privilege to be able to preach it all the times I have. I'm also thankful for the times God opens my mind up to see things I never saw. But as you're turning there this morning, I want to give you a little bit of a background. We're going to pick up in chapter 28, verse number 1. But some of you may not understand or know the backstory because you may have never read this or maybe it's been a long time. But before we pick up in our text, I wanted you to realize here that the Apostle Paul, who has been taken prisoner along with over 200 people on board a ship, has now for about 14 days, a space of about 14 days or so, has been in the midst of storms and then calm, storms and calm out on the, on the ocean. And as a prisoner on board the ship with many other prisoners, it's easy for us to come away with the conclusion that the last 14 days of Paul's life has been very challenging. Paul has tried to advise these people not to sail. They sail on anyway. At one point, Paul's trying to get the mind of God about what the voyage is going to be like. They even face something called a Eurocladon. I have preached about the Eurocladon in the past, but the Eurocladon is a very unusual storm. One of the things that makes it so unique is that in the majority of storms, the wind's going to blow from one direction. So if you have a storm and it's coming up, the wind is blowing from the south, or maybe it's blowing from the north, or maybe you're in a storm coming from the east or the west, the wind is blowing violently. But the reason that they call it a Eurocladon is because the wind comes from every direction all at the same time. You've ever been in a Eurocladon storm and it felt like it was coming from all directions? Come on, some of you can identify. This is what Paul has been dealing with and all these other prisoners on board the ship. So by the time that we pick up in our text... It is clear that they have really been through a difficult season of their life. I want you to look at verse number one, and I want you to see that on the heels 
of the ship that they were on breaking apart violently. The Bible telling us that some people had escaped on boards, some had swam to shore, but they all survived. I would also add that some of them or most of them barely made it alive. Verse 1 says this, And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Milita. Some would also call this the island of Malta. Verse 2, And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness. What that means there is that they showed them kindness. Hard for you to understand by looking at that, that they were actually kind people of the island. For they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, They said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he had escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. What were they saying? This man must be a murderer because fate ain't going to let this man go. But verse 5 turns that whole whole thing around, and it says he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. This isn't a part of my message, but I'm going to tell you there's a lot of people that draw conclusions about you and what you've gone through that God's able to change their mind when they see you come through it. Come on and say amen. Amen. Like I said, I've never preached this before, but I just feel an unction from the Holy Ghost to preach today on the serpent's last strike. The serpent's last strike. Will you pray with me this morning that God will have his will and way in this place? Dear Lord God of heaven and earth, as we stand before you knowing our great need of you, we pray that you will show up and show out in this place. I'm asking you, God, to flex in this service to remind us that you are a mighty God, that no matter what the enemy brings against us, no matter how hot the trials are, no matter how many poisonous attacks come at us, that, God, you have your churches back. And, God, today you're going to show us that you are still on the throne and that, God, that our own good is in mind when it comes to the trials we face because we serve a loving and a righteous God. We're going to praise you for what you do in this place, and all of God's people can say, Amen. As I said, I'd like to preach for a while on the subject title of the serpent's last strike. Most all of us that are here today can identify with what we have seen happen in this text, because in reality, I don't know what you do, but a lot of times I read the Bible, and I think about what the Bible is saying in contrast to what I have personally been through myself. How many of you can get something out of the Word of God because you can relate to what the Bible is actually saying? How many of you get ministered to like that? Isn't that a beautiful thing? But much like Paul, we can see the contrast of what we've been through just like he was when he just come through one of the most violent, and difficult storms of his life. Maybe you're here today, you say, I just went through a foreclosure in the last few years, or I just went through a divorce not that long ago. I just went through the loss of a loved one in the last few months or last few years, or I've just been through a place in my life where we nearly lost everything that we had financially, or I went through a place where I didn't know if I was going to survive. I went through a place where I nearly died. I went through a place where I thought that the end was right here. I thought I was on the verge of divorce. I went through this or I've been through that. Some of us can understand what it feels like that when you just come through one of the most violent places of your entire life, if you can say amen to me this morning, I believe that there are some that can identify with that. 
As a matter of fact, there are some that could identify with Paul because we have barely held on and finally feel like we've just finally made it to land. It's been 14 days of the worst trial I've ever been through. The storms have been blowing. The wind has been howling every direction. Rain has been pounding the ship for days on end. And the storms have just about taken us completely under. We went through one of the worst shipwrecks known to man. And yet here we are in the word of God showing us that we've just barely made it to land. Have you ever been there? The Bible tells us that it's raining and the people are soaking wet, not just from the ocean water that they just come out of, but they get out of that water and now it's pouring down rain and the Bible says that it's cold. Do you know it's a miserable thing to be cold and right in the midst of unstopping rain, a rain that just continually comes down. And so they've been through it They've made it to land. It's pouring rain in. They're freezing cold. And they're just desperately hoping to finally recover from what they just came through. The one thing that Paul and all these uh, prisoners on board wanted desperately was to get off that ship. We have been out there in the ocean for over 14 days and all we want is to be on land. Well, guess what? They barely escaped with by the skin of their teeth, made it to land, and now here we are freezing on an island soaking wet with barbarous people we don't know. We don't know if these are good people. We don't know if these are bad people. We're in a strange place. Thank God it turns out that they seem like that they're good people because these people go and help to build a fire. In the midst of all that, I want you to see that we just like Paul. We're exhausted. We're spent. We finally decide, you know what? I'm going to gather some wood and I'm going to put it on the fire in hopes of relaxing and finally recovering from all that I've just come through. You ever felt like that emotionally? I just need a piece. I just need to, I'm on the other side of my trial and all I want to do is recover at this point. And yet we see him gather the wood. He tosses the wood on the fire, imagining that the worst is now behind us. If I can just get warm, if I can just get better from what I've been through. And now, right in the midst of that, the very fire that was meant for his peace and his recovery and his warmth and his betterment, there is a serpent that's got one last strike in this season that Paul has been through to try to take him out. Have you ever felt like life was just like that? It's like the devil had to go one more time as if it wasn't bad enough that everything I've already been through and you gotta throw one more monkey wrench right in the middle of everything I've been through. Oh, that's the way life is sometimes. It's one of those, well, you have got to be kidding me right now moments. Has anybody ever felt like that? Man, you gotta be straight up joking me right now. Are you kidding me after everything I've done been through and now this have you ever felt like that and it seemed like we say well when it rains it pours Uh, it's one of those moments that we say things like man if it ain't one thing It's another. That's about the way it feels sometimes. And I feel like God sent me here to preach to somebody who's either been through that recently, going through it right now, or you're about to walk through a season you're gonna feel just like I'm preaching here this morning. Because in everyday life, it feels like that we've been beat, nearly slapped to death. We're laying on the boxing ring floor, Brother Matt. There we are, just about on the verge of death, realizing and oh man, wow, I'm still alive. I made it through that trial only for your opponent to to walk by, see you laying there about to die and giving you one last swift kick to the head while you're already down. That's like, man, I just came to a surgery that I barely made it through, got out and found out my mama died. While I was in surgery, my mama died. I wasn't even there to say goodbye. Amen, that's the times when you lose your job 
job, get home and find divorce papers uh, laying on the kitchen table. Uh, the times you can't understand uh, why that you and your husband are finally at a place where you feel like a marriage ain't gonna work uh, and you look and turn around and find out your child has got a terminal illness you can't change. Uh, come on, somebody. Sometimes life uh, kicks you the hardest uh, when you think you're finally at a place uh, where you can recover. But let me tell you something this morning. Uh, amen. That devil may have one last strike, uh, but my God's always got the final say. Can somebody say amen? Oh, come on, that's right. When I consider Paul's near-death experience with that serpent, the Lord spoke this into my mind. The serpent's last strike. Over the last few days, I've never thought about this. Never came to my mind. But the Spirit of God spoke to me the serpent's last strike. I didn't know where God was taking me. I didn't know what God was going to show me. But I can tell you the devil obviously had one last card up his sleeve that he was going to try to take God's man out. But by God's grace, even when the devil had one last card up his sleeve, the devil said, well, I didn't kill him in the storm. He didn't get taken out by the ship. He didn't drown in the ocean. The barbarians didn't kill him. He didn't get hypothermia from the rain and the cold. Let me strike at him one more time. But by the grace of God, God let Paul shake that snake off in the fire and he came out on the other side. There's some of you who've been through hell and high water but you need to tell the devil this morning I'm coming out of this in the name of Jesus one way or the other. Amen. In all of this, I took note of something, Brother Eric. I began to look, paying attention to something I've never really thought about before. The idea of one last strike in desperation. The enemy's last attempt to try to take us out in a particular trial, storm, or season. So that desperate enemy has become so desperate that he's willing to risk death to strike you one last time. Now, I don't mean to sound comical, but some of you understand that's not a brand new concept. I get bit by mosquitoes down here in Florida all the time, and I've often thought that's got to be the dumbest insect on the planet because every time you get struck, there's a high probability that some human's going to reach down and swatch you and smash you, sending blood everywhere, and that's the last time you're ever going to drink blood. You think to yourself, when ants start crawling on you and you reach down and smash them or pop them, you think you got to be the dumbest insect there is because you're not going to get away with biting me like that. But do you know there's animals and there are insects that are willing to risk one last attempt to get you, one last attempt to pull you down or to pump venom into you and risk their life in the process. It's not a new concept, oh no. It's the last strike attempt. Even if it cost that serpent his own life, he was gonna reach out and bite that man of God, but he shook it off in the fire. Amen, I want you to know that in the thousands of animals and insects that try to bite and pump poison every day with a last ditch effort to strike out, there is one that some of us are familiar with. It's the honeybee. You may not have known this, but the honeybee has a stinger that when that stinger goes down into your flesh, it has little barbs on it, much like that of a fishing hook. Those barbs cause that stinger to get stuck in your flesh. But here's the part that's crazy. When that bee flies away, he pulls his entrails out, leaving the stinger in you. What does that mean? It's his last chance to strike. It's his last chance to sting. He will die after he puts his stinger in you. It's inevitable. He can't live with his guts ripped out, but he's willing to do that. Do you know the devil hates you so bad? Even if it cost him something, he's willing to give you one more heart attack, one more problem, one more trouble, one more accusation from those who said they were your best friends. He's willing to attack you on your own turf and try to take you out and ruin your reputation. 
Oh, yeah, that's right. But I want you to know something still. It places the value of harming another over the price tag of its own life. You know, I love honeybees. I really do. But don't that sound about like the devil? Willing to do whatever it takes to cause you pain, suffering, heartache, and misery. He don't care what it costs you. He's just like that. I want you to know this morning, we are at war with an enemy who loves to strike when we're down and we're at our very lowest. So think it not strange when that fiery trial comes at the worst moment. When you think that you've already got the worst news you can experience. Let me tell you, I went through a season like that. Most of you have heard my testimony, but it was crazy to me. How in the world can one thing and another thing and another thing and another thing? I said, dear God, is it ever going to end? The enemy was trying one last strike to take me out. Amen. Watching my wife code in the hospital, her getting a blood clot in her hand, finding out she's got an aortic aneurysm, uh, finding out that my brain tumor's grown, uh, finding out that my, my I was problems in my family. Couldn't see my grandchildren uh, laying on the floor praying one night. Get a massive nosebleed everywhere. Pull the meniscus in my knee. Hobbling around the hospital by myself. Trying to make it here and there. Couldn't work. Couldn't take care of myself. About to lose my mind. Laying in the bed all the time. Feeling like a nobody from nowhere. And let me tell you, if that wasn't enough on the way to church, or a store one day uh, right down the road here. Ran right in the back of some Somebody under stress. I thought I was going to lose my ever living mind. But let me tell you, I'm still on the winning side right here today. Even though it seemed like one attack after another attack and another attack, God's still on my side. Somebody right now, you're going through something that doesn't make sense. And I don't know about you, but I honestly love it. When I see the enemy take one last swing at us, and we still come out on top when it's over. I do. I don't know, I mean, for a Christian, that's almost like watching a football game where somebody's like down like 30 points or something, and in the last quarter, they come back and win the game. Because the enemy thinks he's got you, just like he thought he had Jesus on the cross. But that's exactly what happened to Paul. Here's a man that has absolutely been through it. That's why Paul had the testimony that you heard in the word of God where he said that he has spent a night and a day in the deep, that he had been uh, beaten with many stripes, been in prison, amen, oftentimes. Uh, and he said, and after all this, the care of the church, this man had the weight of the world on his shoulders uh, and the enemy just kept striking and striking. In one season, if it wasn't bad enough, he'd throw one more thing at him. But that man always got back up when the grace of God got on him and he'd go to preach another message. You know, that's the way life ought to be. Even though hell is breathing hot, even though my life got turned upside down, I will trust God to rewrite the chapter, the next chapter of my life. Huh? I don't always understand everything I go through, do you? Some of you got scars like speed bumps in your life of things that still hurt every time you talk about it. Think about it. Come on now and help me preach. But guess what? You're still on the winning side. God's gave you the grace to rise up above it. And it's your choice what you're going to do with it. Say amen, somebody. I mean, I've been through a whole lot. But God give me the grace to shake off this mess that I'm feeling right now. God, give me the grace to shake off what they're saying about me right now. God, give me the grace to shake off this physical infirmity that I'm dealing with right now. God, give me the grace to get through this financial mess that I'm dealing with. Let me shake this off because I've got something I've got to do for God and I'll tell you what the enemy likes to do. That one last strike to get you so discombobulated that you can't even think straight and you can't minister for God, you can't effectively witness for God, and you lose your own testimony right in front of the very people you work so hard to preach to and get them saved. Come on, am I right, anybody? One last attempt. But I want you to know something all throughout the Bible. We see examples much like what Paul went through where God's people in seasons of their life where that, that old serpent Satan made one last strike 
in a season of their life. We saw it with Job. Job lost most everything that he had. But let me tell you about how the enemy fought against Job. You see, God lifted the hedge, strike after strike after strike. But I serve a God who the same one who lifted that iron curtain of his hedge of protection will one day step up on the balcony of heaven, peer overboard and say, that's enough. That's the last strike. That's the last attempt. And he brings that iron curtain of his provision, his protection of that hedge of God back down and says, now, devil, the fun is over with. I would to God that somebody would realize uh, that God's about to step over your situation and say, devil, you've wreaked havoc long enough. That's the last strike. The hedge is going back in place and you have no more right to, to do nothing else in this season. You have fought, you have tormented, you've tried. But that's your last strike. He did it with Job. As a matter of fact, there came a day in the very final hours of Jesus' earthly life in which the serpent of hell struck violently so violently that Jesus ended up beaten nearly to death a crown of thorns on his head his side pierced through he's hanging on a criminal's cross where he gives up the ghost and cries father forgive them for they know not what they do but listen what Satan didn't know what he failed to realize is with that last strike that our God was going to reach down and pull the stinger right out of hell Come on. (laughs) Amen. Our God reached right down and pulled the stinger right out of death, hell, and the grave. Pastor, are you sure? 1 Corinthians 15 and 55 said, O death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. What was he saying, church? He was saying that that devil had won one more strike on the kill called Calvary. But in that season of life, God the Father reached down and ripped the stinger right out of death and hell. Somebody say, thank God. The devil may have one more strike, but my God's still on the throne. If you haven't had a chance to read the very back of this book that we call the Bible, there's gonna be one final strike. Huh? I want you to hear me because we're not a we're not a crippled at the knees church. We're not a broke down need a kickstand kind of church. We are the mighty army of God. If you're a part of this army, we're going to ride in the battle of Armageddon when the blood is up to the horse's bridle. It's going to say king of kings and lord of lords on the thigh. There's going to be a white stallion. He's going to be riding on in that battle. And if you plan on being in that battle, you're a child of God, so do I. But let me tell you, in that last day the Bible said that the tells us there will be a final strike when God says that is it. It is over. How many of you remember when the Bible said that Satan will be cast in the pit of that lake of fire into that pit for a thousand years? But when that is over with, tell me what happens after that because there will be a last strike. That's it, devil, no more. Your fun and games are over with. The Bible said in Revelation 20 and 7 and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth Gog and Magog to gather them together to battle the number of whom is the sand of the sea and they went upon the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be torn in a day and night forever and ever. Why? Because that's your last strike, buddy. There's going to come a day whenever your shenanigans will be over with. There will come a day when all this that I've been through that I cannot explain and I don't understand that God's going to say enough is enough. When that wall you've been hitting and God says, move that wall out of the way. 
open up the door for them. You may go down to the permit station, Brother Matt, apply, 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 keep hitting a wall. But I serve a God that when his will is fulfilled, he says that's the last strike. And he says, open that door. Give them people what I have already planned for them. Huh? I serve a mighty big God. He said, well, I've applied for that job 12 different times before. And it seems like the enemy's doing everything he can to browbeat me and make me think that I'm a big fat loser. Just a giant zero. But let me tell you something. Whenever you put your confidence in God, your faith is in the God of glory. I want you to know that you serve a God who puts his foot down. We got any parents here? Got any grandparents? We got any protective parents in the house? We got any really protective aunts? I've been around some protective family member before. And let me tell you, there's always a final strike. And that's it. Huh? I have been around family before. When kids are being kids and they are playing and they're beating the snot out of each other, pulling toys, mine, 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 mine. And everybody's sitting back watching. But there are some parents that after a while, and they see, oh, you just slapped him, I mean, right upside the head. That is it. I will never forget, whenever I was a young man, I was a teenager, and I had an uncle, his name was, uh, we called him Uncle James. My Uncle James, and I'm not here to brag on fighting, fist fighting, but my Uncle James was one of the baddest dudes you ever met in your life. My mom and my dad and her other brother were at a bar one night when they were teenage or upper uh, young age, if you will. And they were at a bar one night and these men kept flirting with my mom and one of them was trying to force my mom to dance with him and my uncle stood up and said, buddy, the best thing for you to do is go somewhere. About three minutes went by, next thing you know, there's four or five men standing around. My mom told me, she said, I ain't never seen nothing so crazy in all my life. Uncle James knocked all four men out one by one, just bam, 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 just like that. Left every one of them standing on the floor. Do you know what happened? Somebody stood up and said, no, that's enough. That is enough. I'm glad I serve a God who says that's enough. This family's done been through enough. This family's already felt enough torment. Mama's done left and she's done lost enough sleep by now. Daddy's already just about lost his mind worrying about the bills and everything. I'm glad I serve a God who said that's enough. That's enough. My God, that's enough. But I'm glad that there are people that'll stand up for you, that'll step in when it's necessary. I'm glad I serve a God who's got my back. And even though that there are times that God said, well, I'm gonna watch for a little while, and you're gonna go through a few things, it's gonna create character in you. But when it gets to the point that he says, oh no, devil, you've went a little bit too far this time. You stepped over the boundary, that's it. I'm preaching to somebody here this morning that has been struck repeatedly. Your family has gone through so much adversity, you personally, and some of it is your own doing. But I'm here to tell you, you have a loving God who has been watching what's going on. There were times that I have thought to myself, in life, God, where are you? But as a teenager, my Uncle James that I told you about, I was out there playing kickball. This was before, this is when kids actually went outside in 100 degree weather. We were out there playing kickball with the cousins. And I had a cousin, his name was Tony. He was about one year younger than me and an instigator, and he drove me nuts. Well, every time I'd get up to kick the ball, Tony was on first base. And Tony would do everything he could to block the base so I couldn't tag the base. So I got tired of it. I, Sister Kim, I thought to myself, no, I'll fix you. I already had it made up my mind what I was going to do. I'll fix you, bub. So when I went up to kick that ball, man, I reared back and I sent it to the moon. Boom! I took off running. There's Tony. 
standing on first base. I thought, keep on standing there, bub. Here I come. Man, I hit Tony so hard, I knocked him clear about 10 feet away from the base. I come around first base, headed to second base. I thought Uncle James was going to kill me. He said, boy, you better be glad you as a kid. He said, because I'd knock your teeth out right now. Let me tell you, what was Uncle James doing? Uncle James was standing up for his child because what I did was a little bit unnecessary. I took it to another level. And by all rights, it's frustrating when you watch somebody that you love get hurt like that. I mean, I nearly knocked his teeth clean out of his mouth. He laying on the floor moaning and crying and going on. Let me tell you something. That don't sit well with a daddy that loves his child. And it don't sit real well. If you think that God sits up in heaven and gets pleasure watching you go through mess, he don't. Sometimes you wonder, where are you, God? But God says, let me tell you, there will always be a place of your life. There will always be a season where I put my foot down and tell the devil that's it. And if you're here this morning and you've been going through it, I've come to tell you there is encouragement in the kingdom. And there's a God that loves you enough to see what's been going on. And I serve a God who can open up the floodgates and all of a sudden, all the goodness and the mercy and the benefits and the blessing that it seems like have been bottled up from you and kept back that begin to pour out. See, God... There have been places of my life in the last year. Oh, Lord, the last couple of weeks. Oh, God, the last couple of months of my life, I didn't even want to live. Can I ask anybody here to be honest with you? Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever gone through such mess before that you thought, Lord, if this is all there is to life, please just take me on out of here? Me, I've been there. I've been through so much misery before. And I thought to myself, God, if this is all I'm good for, laying around the bed all the time, I can't preach no more, I can't work, I can't provide for my, just take me on to heaven because I don't have no purpose here. It's in those seasons that God is able to redefine our character because when we come out on the other side, we come out with a testimony that tells other people, you've been bit and bit and bit. But in time, you're going to come through this and you're going to have a testimony to help others who have gone through or are going through the same thing you're going through. I can still remember talking with Sister Nora, going through the losses she has been through, in tears, broken. And I remember you telling me, I don't know how to overcome this. I can't seem to get over this. It just is on my mind every day. It's just beating me down constantly. And I remember telling Sister Nora, I said, Sister Nora, if you can't do anything else, find a way to funnel that support, that encouragement, and that hope on the other side of the storm to the people who might be going through something like you have been through. I told her, I said, try your best to become an advocate. Do you remember that conversation? Being an encourager. Now, when she watches her uh, daughter in love going through the stages of cancer and her son dealing with all that, she can say, babies, I've been through loss. I've been through agony. I've had heartbreak. I've been through some crazy stuff in my life. Somehow or another, I don't know how, but by the grace of God, I made it on the other side. But let me tell you something. Don't ever lose your hope in the Lord. Don't ever let go of God's garment. Don't ever let go of the hand of God because he's everything you've got in this world. Somebody here this morning feel what I'm preaching. I came today with a message to encourage those of you that may say, Pastor, I have felt so perplexed. I just don't know. I don't understand what I've been through. I don't understand why this is happening to me. I have been so hurt and so devastated, Pastor Myers, that I spend a lot of days thinking about Everything I could have done right and everything I've done wrong and where I went wrong and was it my fault? I've played so many scenarios through my mind. I'm talking to you through the Spirit because I feel God giving me some things that some of you have been feeling in your heart lately. But let me tell you something. You need to stop and realize the attack was on purpose. 
The enemy did what he did, and he is doing what he has done and done for years on purpose. There's a song that we sing sometimes, and some of you have heard it, maybe sang it. And it says, I never lost my hope. I never lost my praise. I never lost my joy. But most of all, I never lost my praise. I lost a lot of things. But somehow I kept the ability in the midst of the pain when I was being struck one after another after another with stuff that didn't make a lick of sense. But I kept on praising him. And now on the other side of my mess, I can look to those around me and say, hold on till the storm's over. God will bring you through. I wonder if you could stand to your feet across the house of the Lord and there be anybody here today that has already been through it, that has the ability to say, he's done it for me. I believe he'll do it for you. If you're here this morning and you say, Pastor Myers, I've been wrecked in my mind. I've been dealing with things in my spirit, things I don't understand. Maybe it's not you at all. I hope I can say this morning that I have completely obeyed God. I believe I have. Maybe it's somebody online. I don't know. But can you this morning say, I've been through so much, and sometimes I just need a break, God. Sometimes I just need a break from all this. Well, God's come by to let you know that the breaking has come. And right now is the moment. And I want you to start believing for the transition, the change. God, I've had times in my life where I thought to myself, Lord, if you can't stop this trial or you're not going to, at least... Could you do me a big favor? Could you, just, could you just slow things down for a little while? Can, can you let me come up and get a breath of air? Because I feel like I'm about to choke to death. And maybe that's you here this morning. Sister Miranda, come to the piano, please. I want you to be reminded that your God loves you a whole lot more than you realize. And no more than I'm going to let somebody sit there and slap my kids around beat on them, abuse them, there comes a time that God steps in and God says, that is enough. Amber, it's the serpent's last strike. I believe that you can mess around and stir up God and you don't want to mess with God. He loves His people. He loves them so much that He died on the cross for them. What kind of love is that? As your head is bowed and your eyes closed this morning, I want to ask you a very, very personal question. You ready? Is God talking to you? Have you been through some stuff that you just could not quite wrap yourself around? Is some of it your fault? Maybe none of it's your fault. Maybe all of it's your fault. Regardless of the situation, I want you to know that you serve a God, or you can serve a God, who will stand on your behalf today. Sometimes we feel like we got to be our own defense attorney. We forget the Bible said, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I shall repay. So God, I'm going to get them back for what they did to me. I'm going to show them they mess with the wrong person. No, honey, you back up. Let God handle this. You just don't know what they've said about me. No, you, you step back. Let God take care of that. You just don't know how they've done me, how much money they took from me. You just don't realize how they've talked about me when I'm not around. You let God take care of that. Because that serpent's always going to take it one step too far before God steps in and says, that is enough. He's going to stand up for his child. He's going to reach down, send a healing. Reach down, touch the body. Reach down, touch the marriage. Reach down, touch the